eagle-eyed viewers might have noticed that I'm not in my bedroom today. <laughs> Chainmail, the mysterious armour invented by someone at some point two and a half thousand years ago. Let's talk about that and how heavy it is to run in. Why did I run a 5k in chainmail? Oh. Chainmail's a funny old thing. First of all, the, the word chainmail really rubs people up the wrong way, but get over it. Um, call it mail, whatever, it's fine. We all know what you're talking about. Doesn't really matter. But it's not really chain. Yeah, but they are interlocking rings of metal, which is kind of what a chain is, so... Chainmail is versatile, very useful armour, which is why it was in common use for well over a thousand years in various parts of the world. Nobody really knows when it was invented. The earliest piece I think we've got is from around the 3rd century BC. It was probably invented a, a couple of centuries before that, so... Maybe the 5th or 4th centuries, somewhere in probably Eastern Europe, uh, by one of the Celtic peoples around there. We genuinely don't know. We really don't know. If anybody tells you they definitely know who invented chainmail when, they're lying. It was very quickly adopted, though. It was quickly adopted by the Romans, by various other Celtic peoples in Western, Northern, Southern and Eastern Europe. It became one of the standard forms of armour. It was taken down into the Middle East, into the Near East, over to Japan, uh, down to Africa. And it's pretty much a universal old world armour from sort of the 3rd century AD right the way through into the 17th century and longer in some places. Um, you still see it in some modern army uniforms here and there. But what is it? Well, it's effectively a fabric made of metal. You take an iron bar, you draw it through a draw plate, which is basically a piece of metal filled with holes of gradually smaller size, until it gets to the diameter of wire that you want. You wrap it round a wooden core, or a metal core I suppose, you chop the rings off, flatten the ends, punch a hole in them, and then put a rivet through it, and you can rivet the rings together to make a lovely, very flexible, strangely flexible, quite heavy metal fabric. That's Mail. Job done. Some mail shirts are made entirely out of riveted rings, some are made of riveted rings with solid rings, sort of every now and then. Some are completely made of solid rings that are what they call butted together, so you, you just sort of... the edges of the wire ring, like that. They're a lot weaker than the riveted shirts generally, they're not as well suited to actual combat much cheaper because they don't involve riveting 30 or 40 thousand rings. Oh, don't forget to mention your average male shirt, a hauberk, that is a sort of thigh length, half arm length shirt, between 30 and 40 thousand rings. It's very good for things like slight sort of weaker dragging blows. Uh, it can be effective against some kinds of arrowhead. It's not particularly bad if you've got somebody with a broad axe whacking its blade at you. It will stop wide bladed attacks. What it won't stop is particularly determined narrow point attacks. So bodkin arrowheads can go through mail. A very determined spear thrust can go through mail. And the other thing it doesn't stop is blunt force trauma. So if somebody wallops you with a mace and you're wearing a mail shirt, it will still bruise you, and it will still break bones, and it will still cause concussive damage to your body and your, your internal organs. So it's not perfect armour. There's no such thing, really, as perfect armour in the Viking Age. What did they wear underneath it? We don't know. Probably a layer or two of wool. Almost certainly not the big Michelin Man gambesons you see everybody wearing in reenactment events. Why not, Jimmy? Well, because those were basically developed to counter the needle bodkin arrows that start appearing in the high medieval period. In the Viking Age, they're not really as much of an issue. Quite frankly, there's, there's no evidence to suggest whatsoever that the Vikings needed those big, chunky gambesons. How expensive was mail in the Viking Age? Super, ultra, mega expensive. Very, very expensive. A little later, in I think the 11th century, possibly the early 12th, a man has to have eight hides of land before he is required to bring a mail shirt and a helmet with him to battle. 
So that is a fair amount of land. That's quite a lot of property, that's quite a lot of money, that is somebody who is quite wealthy. In the Viking Age, a mail shirt wasn't just armour, it was also a symbol of wealth and position in society. So it's important stuff. If you see somebody wearing a mail shirt in battle, you know, he's, he's probably a nobleman. He's probably richer than you. Considerably richer than Yao. So this video is all about what you can do wearing a mail shirt. And I have a few insights on that because I just ran a 5k for charity in my Viking mail shirt. My mail shirt is made of mild steel, it's riveted and solid rings, so we have some of the rings are made the way I said in the intro, and some of them are solid. And the only Viking Age mail shirt we have from Europe is the German Boo shirt, and the rings in that have an internal diameter of around 6mm, which is the same as my shirt, uh, it is made of solid and riveted rings, same as mine. The rivets have a round profile to the top, same as mine. And the, the round profile riveted rings are drawn wire, same as mine. And the solid rings are punched out of a flat sheet, same as mine. So it's pretty damn close to how these things were made in the Viking Age. The steel is different, obviously, but it's super difficult too impossible to get that volume of 100% authentically made steel. I don't have access to that much bloomery iron. I'm sorry. It weighs around 15 kilograms, so 33 pounds. The bit we have left of the German Boo shirt, and that's, you know, less than half of it, I think. It was cremated, so don't cremate your mail shirt if you want it to survive. Uh, that weighs about 5.5 kilo. So I'm running in Viking armor, effectively. This is as close as you can get to running in actual Viking Age armour. I didn't run wearing a helmet because... I mean, I'm not going to run wearing a helmet. It was already likely I was going to overheat. Wearing a helmet would have just made it dangerous. Um, so no. I ran in modern footwear because I have knee and ankle problems and turn shoes provide zero ankle support, so... No? Also, I'm doing it for charity, not to kill myself. The route we chose for this was the Meadows in Edinburgh. It's pretty much perfectly flat. There's a measured mile-long route around it, which meant that if we did that route three times, bish bash bosh, we've basically done a 5k. I did it with a couple of my mates, John Jacob, who's another reenactor mate of mine from Edinburgh, and Dave McGrath, who runs the Reenactment Scotland page over on Facebook and Instagram. It's well worth checking out if you're interested in what's going on in the world of reenactment up in Scotland. So, in terms of training for this, there's this idea that you have to be super mega strong just to put on Viking armour. Just to put on chainmail and a helmet, you have to be some Olympic level athlete who is completely shredded, who's got pecs you could carve commandments into, and that's bollocks, that's nonsense. I am a 31 year old man who plays far too many video games, who eats far too many pizzas, who did about nine months of actual training for this, and you're gonna see how I got on. But you do need to train. If you're going to do this kind of thing, you need to train. The people who were wearing this armor in the Viking Age weren't just randomers off the street. This isn't Helm's Deep, where every kid just gets a mail shirt. This stuff cost a lot of money. So this stuff is expensive. This is like the Lamborghini of its day. If you've got one of these, you are minted. Bearing that in mind, these men would have been trained in how to use it. They'd have been used to wearing it, they'd have been trained in how to fight in mail with a shield, with a weapon, and a helmet. So they're used to this stuff. This isn't people just jumping in at the deep end. These are men who've probably from birth been moulded as warrior nobles. Okay? That's not me. <laughs> I've had my mail shirt for about five or six years now and I went through a period of wearing it nearly every day for work. I used to do a lot of school workshops as a Viking. Now I wear it three or four weekends a year. My first training event for it was a one mile run, which wrecked me. I was wrecked. I pulled a tendon in my right calf. I got a groin strain. I had some inflammation in my knees and my ankles. It was not good. After that, massive catastrophe, I had to work my way back up again to where I was comfortable A, doing a 5k without the armour, plus a little bit extra, and B, I had no injuries whatsoever. 
no strains, no pulls, no tendon issues, nothing. Do not try and do this if you've got any kind of injury. I cannot emphasize that enough. It will make them worse. By the time the event rolls around, <clears throat> I can do a 5K pretty comfortably. I'm used to wearing the armor. I know how tight I need the belt to get it comfortable around my waist and to take a little bit of the weight off. I know how much knee support and ankle support I need. If you have any kind of injuries long term that mean you need bracing for exercise, put it on if you're going to do this. It just makes it a lot easier. So we got to the start line and I set off at what I thought was a fairly comfortable pace. What I wasn't expecting was a gang of my friends and subscribers to turn up at the meadows in Edinburgh. So diolch and iawn i pob in ohonoch Thank you so much to every one of you who turned up and gave me all that support. I couldn't have done it without you guys. Major shout outs to James, who was our water carrier, who acquired a bicycle from somewhere at one point and started cycling around the route just on a bike with water. And uh, my biggest personal thanks to Graham, who is a friend of the channel, uh, who kept pace with me all the way around the course. My next big tip is do this with friends because it is tough doing this on your own. My usual time for a 5k is about 25 minutes. I'm normally between 24 and 28 minutes depending on you know whether I'm doing it to sweat or whether I'm just having a nice calm jog around the park. The first lap was absolutely fine. No problem at all. Uh, we got all the way around. I, I couldn't feel any particular problems developing. Uh, I didn't have any injuries. I was out of breath, needed some water, but apart from that, it was fine. So that's one mile down. That's, you know, one and a half kilometers ish. The second lap is where it really started to hit me. Uh, the places that it mostly got me were my calves, the backs of my legs, and my shoulders. The shoulders, despite the belt spreading some of the weight, are where a lot of that shirt is hanging from. It's hanging off your shoulders. So even if you've belted it quite high up, and I belted it at my natural waist, which is quite high, you still have, you know, 10, 12 kilograms of weight dangling off your shoulders, and it bounces a little bit as you run, as you can see. So the second lap got me bad. I was tired, I was starting to feel uh, all of my muscles working really hard. You know that bit where you're doing exercise, where you feel a bit of burn? and then you start to feel the fatigue, just starting to get that. The third lap, so the last lap, <clears throat> was painful, actively painful. My lungs were burning, I was sweating cobs, it was getting into my eyes, uh, the mail was getting hotter and hotter and hotter, the wool layer underneath it was soaking up sweat, heating up really fast. Wool is very good at keeping its temperature, so wet, hot, wet wool will still be warm and this wool was both hot from how much heat I was putting out and it was soaked with sweat so I was basically insulated in a two stone metal t-shirt with a wet wool blanket keeping the heat inside it it was bad it was really bad uh, I wasn't dehydrated yet <clears throat> but by the end of the third lap I was on the verge of tears I was almost crying with fatigue. I hadn't stopped, I hadn't gone into a walk at any point. I'd kept it at an average speed of around six and a half miles an hour, which is sort of jogging speed for me. Graham was fine, upsettingly fine, <laughs> just talking to me about all of these adventures he's had over the last couple of decades and how he runs marathons whilst drinking pints of beer because he's an absolute legend. And meanwhile, I'm just there sweating into my eyes, blinded with salt, shouting and screaming in Welsh and making sort of wounded dog noises. <laughs> <sighs> <sighs> <laughs> so by the very end of it, by 4k, 4 kilometers in, <clears throat> just under 3 miles, uh, I was in a bad state. I was uh, completely exhausted, physically exhausted, and by the very end, by 5 kilometers, we actually did 5.2 because I miscalculated. Um, 
have done it without you, then. What was the... Graham kept me company the whole way and was encouraging me and distracting me and all sorts. And... <laughs> yeah. Yay! I'll definitely give you a couple of points <laughs> as soon as we're allowed to go for them. <laughs> Oh. Can I get a wave at the camera? <laughs> Thank you! <laughs> Veteran runner and that <laughs> enabler. I think I pulled a muscle behind my armpit, I'm not sure how. I couldn't stand up. I had to, I had to kneel down. Uh, my knees collapsed under the weight of the mail as soon as I let them. Uh, we got the mail shirt off me as soon as we could. Uh, Very far Dave and John were in better condition, they'd slowed down a few times and, and taken it a bit slower at various points just to keep themselves going and uh, I was, I was we were, we were, none of us were well, none of us was feeling good. We got our mail shirts off as soon as we could and heat exhaustion set in almost immediately. I was sweating, drenched in sweat and I only had a t-shirt on underneath my mail and my wool. I was physically exhausted I immediately drank a litre of water had one of those glucose tablets that you can get uh, I ate two packets of crisps and then drank another half litre of um, very high sugar energy drink I was wrecked absolutely wrecked my shoulders had tensed so much because of the weight on them my shoulders had been really tensed uh, I thought I'd pulled a muscle behind my armpit that turned out just to be a really bad cramp. Um, I was, I was just, I was on another planet. I was on another planet with how tired I was, but I did it and I survived with no injuries apart from a minor groin strain. And I am now three days post event and the strain has pretty much healed up. So no injuries. No worsening of any other injuries or underlying conditions. I had some heat exhaustion for the rest of the night. I drank about four litres of water. So like nearly eight pints of water after I'd finished the 5k. Before the 5k, I'd already drunk two litres of water that day. I was so wetting. My mail shirt was... Absolutely fine, actually. Uh, I think I lost maybe a couple of rivets, maybe one or two links got left behind, but they do shed links every now and then. Uh, it looks like it's really rusty. That's actually fake blood from some filming I did early last year. Uh, what was my time? So my time for the 5K, wearing 15 kilos of steel, wearing 33 pounds of steel, was 36 minutes and 44 seconds. So I ran three miles in half an hour, wearing two and a half stone of armor so you can do a lot wearing mail you can do a lot of exercise you can push your body quite far i pushed my body as far as it would go that day i had to lie down for a lot of that afternoon so what are the takeaways from this well the takeaways from this are a we raised two and a half thousand pounds for stonewall which is an lgbtq plus charity which helps people who are being discriminated against and there's a link in the description if you'd like to contribute to our fundraising activity and Viking armor is surprisingly easy to wear if you know what it does to you another big tip stretch stretch as much as you can do some bloody ballet stretches in your mail shirt if you can before you do the run and stretch in your mail because if you stretch like you stretch for a normal run put the mail shirt on and then start running you're straining your muscles more your joints are being strained even more than for a normal run so do your stretches in the morning put your mail shirt on then stretch again to get your joints used to what they're going to be under do a little practice jog go for a brisk walk make sure you are ready get prepped prepare for it train for it Run with your mail shirt in your backpack. Run a 5k with it in your backpack. Then run a mile with it with it on. Then run two miles with it on. Then build up. Because building up to it is, I think, what allowed me to do it without injuring myself and in such a decent time. Because that's a decent time. 36 minutes is a decent time. 
So that is my main, my really big insight into this is if you're going to do it, really, really train for it. Build up to it slowly and gradually. Um, like I said, the first practice run I did, twanged a tendon, knackered my knees. Not good. Not good. If you are used to running and you are used to wearing the mail, you can run in the mail. I don't recommend it, but you can. This is stuff that is designed to be exercised in. This is combat wear. This is combat gear. This is for fighting men to wear on the battlefield whilst they're doing strenuous exercise. But this, this is my main takeaway, is this stuff is fine to wear. You can walk in it, you can jog in it, you can run in it. Brace your knee joints up if you have to, but you can do exercise in it. If any of you guys have done any endurance of endurance events in your armour, do let me know. I'd love to hear what kind of mad stuff you guys have got up to wearing chainmail. Massive shouts out to Perrin of Isabel Northwood Costumes and Chelsea, who I will link to in the description for filming on the day. They did an amazing job. They both ran about a mile and a half each, just trying to keep up with us, which is insane. Um, huge props to James, our water carrier, to Graham, obviously, uh, to everybody else who turned up, to uh, Adriano and Tritian and Stan and to uh, Claire who helped out as well. Um, so for today's phrase of the week, I am in Wales. I'm home. I'm home, I'm home, I'm home. For the first time in more than a year. 18 months, I am in Wales. I am in Cae Graig, which is just a short walk from my mother's house in Bangor, where I was born. And we are surrounded by harebells, which are beautiful, beautiful flowers. Lovely things. My mother's favourite flower, harebells. Lovely stuff. Today's very short phrase of the week is just going to be Croeso an all e gumri. Croeso an all e gumri. Welcome, Croeso, an all, back to, uh, e, to, back to, an all, back, return, um, Gumri, Wales. So Wales is Cymru and it mutates to Gumri here, going to Wales, e Gumri. So Croeso, an all, e Gumri. So there you go, very short phrase of the week for you there. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'm going to go and enjoy the sunshine and speaking Welsh with people. And I will see you all next week for another video. Diolch mawr iawn. Tan sra nesa. Hwyl am y tro. Even, even uneagle-eyed viewers probably notice that I'm not in my... I don't sleep on a bed of harebells. I'm not Stig of the Dump. <laughs> oh my god. Do I sound more Welsh? I feel like I sound more Welsh this time. <laughs>